Hi, guys. I wish I was seeing your beautiful faces. Um, thanks for tuning in today and joining us. Um, I'm excited about that and what Michelle was just saying. We want to hear. We want to hear those little statements, just whether it's God saved our marriage or God delivered me from addiction. Get your kids to do it. Um, what's God done for them? And we want to just gather um, as many of you in our family, locally, and even those of you who, who tune in and are part of this community uh, virtually, we, we would love to have you just send that in to us. Um, first of all, I want to just, just start by saying how much we love you, truly. Like, in this season, we have been so, um, I, I know many of you maybe feel like this, where you just feel so much appreciation for this community, this family, how you guys have continued to show up for each other and be so present with each other in this. And um, we feel so grateful to be part of such an incredible community. And, and we're so proud of you guys, how you guys have just served and loved and um, just been a constant voice of hope um, for people around you. And, and I know that some of you are going through really hard times. And, um, you know, as a community, we're very aware of that. And so, Know that we're praying for you daily, Hona and I. We're praying. We're seeking God uh, for you and for your family. Um, Landon, we heard about your dad um, passing with, with the COVID, and we are just praying grace over your family and praying for God to break in and for redemption in this situation and peace in your hearts. And, and Todd and Sarah, same thing, as you guys are, are right in the thick of it with your dad um, and he, as he's fighting for his life, know that we are standing with you as a community and we are believing for healing and restoration and no more spread. We just, um, even as I was just driving here this morning, I was just declaring that Los Angeles, this whole region will not be known as a hot spot for this disease, but we're just commanding this virus to die. Wherever you're tuning in from, wherever you, you live, begin to declare this, that this virus cannot live in this area, and just declaring a safety zone around our community and our family, and just declaring the presence of God, and that what will spread around us is revival in the kingdom of God, and we just command this sickness to die in Jesus' name. And so we are standing with you, family, and um, we know that there's a lot of hard going on. We know some of you um, are out of work or really struggling with just what this means um, for you moving forward. And we just want you to know that we're in this together and that God always has the final say. God has the final say. And, and I've been reminded very much lately that God is not surprised by what's going on. God is not surprised, and God has prepared us for this, whether we realize it or not, and he's perfectly in our midst and perfectly good in the midst of all the craziness we're seeing and experienced, experiencing right now. God is not thrown off, and he is so available to us right now to give us strategy, to give us order, to, to provide, to heal, to restore. And so I want to just really encourage you just to lean into his goodness lean into his goodness. And this is, this honestly, this is why we need a spiritual community around us. And so if you are not plugged in, as Michelle was saying, listen, if you're, you're watching from South Africa or wherever you are, um, you can join one of our virtual grow groups and just be around, you know, spirit people who are just going to encourage you and stand with you and pray with you. And so, um, know that we're with you in this. Um, so, so last week, um, Hona shared and I love what he shared. He, he read out of Matthew 7, 24 and 25, um, if you were on. And it's this verse. It says, everyone who hears my teaching and applies, applies it to his life can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the flood came with fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. So we're instructed that when we hear the word of the Lord, we hear Jesus' teaching, and we apply it to our life, we then become unshakable. And I believe that more than ever, this is time for us to truly show the world what it looks like to live unshakable. And I know that might feel hard, because you might be like, I feel like I'm totally shaking. But here's the invitation. We belong to an unshakable kingdom. 
And the kingdom of God is powerful and good and present, and you have access to everything in the kingdom. And and so Hona challenged us with five truths, which I hope you are reminding yourself throughout the week. I live under a different economy. You can say these with me if you're at home. I live under a different economy. God works all things together for my good. I have authority over all sickness through Jesus Christ. I am anointed to bring good news, and this is my spike year. Now, if you're watching and tuning in with us, um, we've been talking a lot as a church that, that God gave us a word um, in actually the beginning of 2019 that uh, 2020 would be our spike year, that 2018 was bump. This is like volleyball terminology. 2018 was bump, 2019 was set, and 2020 was spike. And last year was all about alignment and God getting us in position for breakthrough and promises fulfilled and, and just breaking into new ground this year. And so we believe that that's what's happening. Um, I want to encourage you to go back, if you didn't hear even the week before, uh, where we reminded ourselves um, about who God says that we are. And we talked about that we are the helpers and we are the healers. We're the truth tellers, the peacemakers, the courageous, and the reformers. That's who we are. It's moments like this where the church shines. And so these are powerful truths I just wanted us to kind of be mindful of as we get into the word today. So as we were praying and just and seeking the Lord about what he wanted to say to us as a community, I kept being very aware of the invitation to pray in this season and the power of prayer. And the reality is, I think sometimes if I'm honest, in the West, um, because we're not... I think, honestly, it's a lot of our privilege and our comfort has left us in a position where we don't rely on prayer like we should. And because of that, our prayer life has gotten a little rusty. And the reality is prayer isn't just meant to um, provide for our needs. Prayer transforms us. Prayer connects us to God. And prayer is our lifeline. Prayer is our power source. Prayer is where the power happens. And so I've been feeling this pull of, of God calling us back into understanding the power of prayer. And so we're going to talk today about the power of prayer. But I want to start with a story. And um, some of you, if you've, you've been around here, you maybe have heard this story before, but it, it was hugely impacting for me. Um, years ago, a long time ago, when I was 21 years old and single, I, I lived for a couple years in um, Kenya and was doing missions work there and became very, very ill and almost died. And um, I was in uh, Nairobi Hospital and basically, long story short, um, was told I probably had about 24 hours to live. I was totally out of it. Multiple, you know, uh, organs were failing at this point. My family had been contacted, told I wasn't going to make it. And um, I remember having, you know, as I was kind of in and out, hooked up to all these tubes and kind of in and out of consciousness, I remember having this moment where I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die alone. There's not anybody in here I know. I'm, I, I can't believe this is happening. I remember just feeling so alone. And... Um, I, I fell asleep, and while I was asleep, I had this dream. And in the dream, I could see myself standing at the, the window of my hospital room. And outside of my window was what I, it kind of threw me off, because I was like, why is the Kenyan army here? It looked like one million soldiers. And I remember standing there thinking, why are there a million soldiers outside in the parking lot? And it, it was, as far as I could see, it was just all of these soldiers were standing at attention facing my hospital window. And I remember in this dream, in this experience, I said, what is going on? And right away I heard the Lord speak to me. And he said, you're not alone. You're not alone. You have no idea how many angels I've dispatched to stand at attention on your behalf. And I was so moved and impacted in this dream. And I remember... Um, waking up and being just this deep peace in my spirit and fear leaving me and just thinking, I'm not alone. There are a million angels standing outside my window. And um, 
I don't have time to tell you the whole story. It's pretty amazing. But God did a miraculous, miraculous healing. I had another encounter with Jesus where he walked in my room um, in my sleep, then in a dream, did surgery on me, and I was completely healed. And it is a profound, profound miracle um, that was very incredible. So anyways, I want to tell you this story because months later, when I came back to California, I went to my home church, small town, and this woman came up to me and she said, I'm desperate to ask you a question. She said, where were you on this day at this time? Well, you don't forget when you're dying in a hospital, right? So I'm like, I knew exactly where I was. It was actually, it was a couple days before Christmas and I knew exactly where I was and I kind of pull out my journal and I'm looking and I'm, I'm and I re- realize this is the exact day she's speaking of, the day I had this dream where I saw the mil- million angels outside. And, and sh- I said, why? And she said, my five-year-old, name's Tabitha, said she came running into our room in the middle of the night, and she woke us up, and she said, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, we have to pray for Jennifer right now. And they were like, okay, go ahead. And she said, no, get up and get on your knees. See, this this girl's, I like her. She made them get on their knees, and so they were like, okay. So they get on their knees next to the bed, and they're like, okay, we're here. And she just said, she just began to pray. Thank you, Jesus, for showing me. I pray right now that you would send Jennifer, five years old, send Jennifer exactly what she needs in Africa. Lord, would you send her one million angels? Amen. The mom's telling me the story. I had, nobody knew about this encounter except a few close family uh, at this point. And she told me she prayed for a million angels to go to you in Africa. It was so, you know, crazy. She's never done anything like that. And I just stood there and I was like, a million angels did come to me. (laughs) in Africa. They stood outside my window, and I shared with her this whole experience I had. And I was so moved by this because I thought, a five-year-old little girl in California prayed, and it changed my reality across the world. May we never forget how powerful our prayers are. Sometimes I wonder if there's just, like, heaven is just waiting, if there are angels just waiting for us to, to partner with the will of God and release them into assignment. And and so I, I tell you that story because I think sometimes we forget how powerful prayer is and that prayer really does change us and change situations. The Bible has a lot to say about prayer. And uh, <clears throat> Romans 12, 12 says, be faithful in prayer. Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord hears the prayer of the righteous. Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray continually. James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And Luke 18.1, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Or if you think about all the times where we see Jesus praying in scripture, right? Like Luke 6.12, Jesus spent the night praying to God. Jesus Jesus needed to pray. Jesus chose to pray. He prayed all the time. So when you look at these scriptures, be faithful in prayer, right? God hears the prayer of the righteous. Devote yourself. Pray continually. Um, You begin to realize when you look at these scriptures, prayer is not like, you know, kind of like a little suggestion. This is like, this is serious language. Pray continually. Don't give up. Devote yourself to it, right? And I look, when I look at the life of Jesus, I think, okay, Jesus walked in such power. He walked in such peace, no matter what was going on around him. And Jesus was constantly connecting to his lifeline in prayer. He was constantly connecting to the Father. He was constantly coming into alignment with the Father's will, even praying, not my will, but yours be done, right? Jesus was constantly coming to this place and... Um, you know, I think we need to move past this idea that prayer is this kind of last-ditch effort. You know, like, uh, you know, panic praying. I don't know about you. Definitely guilty. I definitely have done panic praying in my life. Um, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, please, please, please. You know, you're freaking out. Um, it's not just this kind of like, oh, I better pray. Or, you know, um, p- prayer has to be connected to faith. And it's connected to relationship. And when it's connected both in faith and in relationship to God powerful things begin to happen. 
And I, I feel like God is awakening and reminding the church, especially in the West, of who we are. And he is shaking off everything else that we have not even realized we've put our hope in, our medical system, our finances, right, our economy, whatever. And he's, he's allowing us for a moment to remember, whoa, is my hope in the wrong things? And coming back to our source, our power source, our lifeline, and reconnecting. Because we don't just need prayer when it's hard. We need prayer to thrive. We need prayer if we're going to spike this year. We need prayer to do all the things God has called us to do. Oswald Chambers, who I love, um, in My Utmost for His Highest, he said this. Prayer is not a normal part of the life of the natural man. We hear it said that a person's life will suffer if he doesn't pray, but I question that. What will suffer is the life of the Son of God in him, which is nourished not by food, but by prayer. When a person is born again from above, the life of the Son of God is born in him, and he can either starve or nourish that life. Prayer is the way that the life of God in us is nourished. Our common ideas regarding prayer are not found in the New Testament. We look upon prayer simply as a means of getting things for ourselves, but the biblical purpose of prayer is that we may get to know God himself. To say that prayer changes things is not as close to the truth as saying, prayer changes me, then I change things. Prayer is not a matter of changing things externally, but one of working miracles in a person's inner nature. Prayer changes us. It empowers us, it aligns us, it infuses us. It's our power source. There's two passages that I've been thinking about a lot lately in regards to prayer. You might know them. Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not worry about anything. Uh, Jesus, did you know about this, COVID-19, when you wrote this? Do not worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need. And when you pray, always give thanks. And then 1 Peter 5, 7, which says, give all your worries to him because he cares for you. When you look at these two verses for a moment, right, you hear, don't worry, pray, ask God, give thanks, give your worries to him. You know, the, these verses are, this, this is crazy. Don't worry about anything clearly, God, you are not a Hispanic mother. Like, I, what? Don't worry about anything. What? I mean, how does this even work, right? And so I know for us, we hear this, we're like, oh, yeah, but how, how the heck do I apply this to my life? Is there anybody else that's like, I need to know how to apply this right now in my life, right? How do I apply don't worry when the whole world is freaking out? And... Um, I think there's some, there's four, you know, basic things we see in these two scriptures. Number one, don't worry. Number two, ask God for help. Number three, give thanks. And number four, let go. I think we have, okay, here we go. Don't worry. Ask God for help. Give thanks. Let go. Give it to God, right? So these are the four things that those two verses we just read, these are the four things we're instructed to do. When worry is at the door, you do one of these four things. So, um, I want to just take a moment and kind of just try to give us an example of how to do this in our life. Um, hold on, I lost my notes. Here we go. Okay, um, I'm going to have Jeremy come up. Where's Jeremy? You guys give it up for the amazing Jeremy who's like running cameras and sound, but also going to come up and help me do a demonstration while social distancing and wearing gloves. I mean, Jeremy for the win, guys. Jeremy for the win. Okay, so... We're going we're gonna to just do a little example. Now, here's what's funny. I was talking to Hona about this example, and he's like, this feels like Teen Challenge or something. I'm like, I know, but listen, we need, we need some practicals in our life. We actually just did this very example with our children's ministry a couple months ago when we were talking about peace. We did this exact example, and I was like, I'm actually going to pull out the children's example because I need it. I need this in my life. And so here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to grab this backpack. Guys, we're getting real creative up here. All right. Do you mind just pulling that back a little bit, Jeremy, while I stand six feet away? Look at Jesus. G Jeremy's going to be Jesus in this example. Jesus with gloves on. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. 
So we're wearing these backpacks, and these backpacks, these backpacks kind of um, are a picture of our soul, right? Our emotions, our soul, and, and so I want you just to imagine with me a couple scenarios, which probably none of you are going to be able to relate to at all. Just kidding. Okay, so you wake up to the sound of your kids fighting, and you're like, oh God, oh God, they're not going to school today. And then you, all of a sudden, you feel this like, ugh, this opportunity to worry and to feel stress. And so what you do is you're like, oh, you just, the weight hits you in that morning, right? You're laying there. I can't believe I have to do this again. And it just, you carry that weight. You, you begin to hold it. And then something else begins to happen as the day goes on. You open up your phone. You're reading the news. And you start to feel overwhelmed and stressed out about this disease, and you're like, how am I going to do this? This is, cr I'm stressed out, right? And you start just going through things like this all day long. You sit down to help your kids do their online work. Shout out to the parents, just killing it. And uh, you do that. This, I'm going to get a heavy weight for this because, Lord, help us. And uh, you, you sit down to help your kids, and you're like, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is hard. This is stressful. My kids don't listen. This is crazy. I, I cannot do this. And all of a sudden, you're starting to just kind of carry this weight, right? And, um, and as you're going throughout your day, your husband tells you, you're, you know, all of a sudden you realize, like, okay, I, I'm not going to be able to make rent this month. We're not going to get paid. How am I going to do this? And, and it just begins to weigh you down, right? And thing after thing after thing you know, different situations, I feel alone, I haven't seen anybody in a couple of weeks, and you just begin to carry the weight of things. And by the end of the day, I don't know about you, but I begin to, not just does my soul feel heavy, my body begins to feel sick, right? You just begin to feel like, oh my God, I can't breathe. Is that anxiety or, or I have symptoms? <gasps> and you just start to feel the weight of anxiety. And you begin to feel the weight of just the world, right? But what scripture tells us is that we're not to do that. We're actually not meant to carry the weight, to carry the, the pressures. And, um, and what we are invited to do is these four things. Don't worry. Ask God for help. Right? Um, give thanks and let go. This is very awkward. Hold. Okay, just bear with me, guys. Bear with me. Doing good. Okay. So I want to try this again. Here's a very practical way of how you do this. So Jeremy's going to be God. Hey, God. And uh, all throughout the day, we have opportunities, right? Same scenario. Oh, my gosh, my kids are fighting. I'm waking up. Do I even have coffee left? Can I do this another day? Can I do this, right? And the temptation is to just sit in that for a moment. The temptation is to absorb that. The temptation is to, to just uh, sit in that for a moment and stop and go, okay, wait. Scripture tells me, remember, when we listen to Scripture and apply it, that's how you're unshakable, right? I want to talk about that, listening and applying. Okay, Scripture says I'm to don't worry, ask God for help, give thanks, or let go. I need to pick one of these right now when my kids are fighting and I'm thinking about this. I'm going to, you know, what am I going to choose? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask God for help. God, before I even get out of this bed, will you help me today? Will you help me to manage this, this time and what's going on with my kids? God, I pray for strategies. I pray for great ideas of what to do with them. God, I pray that you would help me today. And all of a sudden, what you do, Jesus and I are social distancing, and what you do is you hand it to the Lord, and he carries it. And I still feel light and free, right? Right? So the next situation comes up, and, and maybe you realize, okay, I don't know how we're going to pay rent. I don't, I don't, I'm not getting paid this month. And you begin to just, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I have to stress. My parents tell me I'm, I should stress. Everybody's telling me I should stress, and that the temptation is to carry it. But then you look at one of these four, and you go, no, hold on. Scripture tells me I'm to do one of these things. I'm to do this. Okay, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give thanks. How am I going to give thanks right now? I'm going to give thanks. God, I thank you that you provide all of my needs. God, I thank you that you are on the throne and that you are a good father right now. And even though I don't know how it's going to come, you will bring manna from heaven. You will bring water out of the rock because that is who you are. I thank you, God, that I have what I need right now, that you are faithful and good to me, that you have always been good to me. I'm not going to carry this weight. I know who my God is. And you hand it off, right? Right? 
The next situation, you know, your friend calls. This is the refried beans friend. Your friend calls, right? And they've, they've lost their job or they're stressed out or they might be sick or whatever. You, it's just you don't even know how to help them anymore. And the temptation is to carry that, but you look and you go, okay, what, what can I do? You know what? I'm going to have to let go. I'm going to have to let God handle this. God, I'm giving her or him to you. God, I ask that you would move in their life. I, I can't fix them, but God, I know you can. So here, God, I give you that friend, right? And you do this throughout your day. You keep picking one of these things. Okay, I'm, I'm going to choose not to worry. I'm going to ask God for help. I'm going to give thanks. I'm going to let go. And you do this all day. And what happens is you walk around light and free. God, is that heavy for you? Are you perfectly capable to carry all of that? Yes. Here's, here's, here is the real invitation of how we can live as believers. I know this might seem kind of cheesy, but I'm telling you we've got to get this because many of us, we are carrying in our body and in our souls weights we are not meant to carry. When you have a strong and good father who wants to carry it for you, we do not have to be anxious about anything. We can give it to God and let God carry us through this season. Amen? Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. All right. We're going we're gonna to jump back in. So that's the example we did with the kids, but I, I thought it was good to just for us to remind ourselves. So I want you to think about these things. Maybe take a picture of this. Don't worry. Ask God for help. Give thanks. Let go. We'll be posting it on our social media and all that, but all day long, it might be 20 times a day, you have to do this. Okay, I'm picking one of these right now. I'm going to give thanks in the middle of this. How do you give thanks in a hard time? You just begin to worship. Watch that thing break, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go. I'm going to ask God for some strategy or help right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to not worry. And so these four things have to become something that are so a part of our everyday life. All right. Well, I want to take the rest of our time this morning together, and I want to talk um, about how Jesus invites us to pray. Now, you might remember in Scripture where one of the disciples comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I mean, okay, I'm paraphrasing, right? Jesus, you got this prayer thing on lock. Like, you are killing it on your prayer game. Like, you pray, heaven shows up. Jesus, you're always peaceful. Jesus, you move in power. Teach us how to pray. How can we have what you have, Jesus? You seem to just connect right into the source. You, you, you know, you, you walk in power. You walk in peace. I want what you have, Jesus. Teach us how to pray. And Jesus responds, and he begins to teach his disciples how to pray. You can read this in both Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. And, um, and so we're going we're gonna to look at this together, the Lord's Prayer. And I want you to remember this. Um, before Jesus teaches them to pray, he says this in Matthew 6. He says, um, verses 8 and 9, he says, Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Okay. I don't know about you. But I've always been like, if you know what I need, why do I need to ask you? Anybody else? Is that just me? I'm such a brat. Okay. I've been like, if you, if you know what I need, why do I even need to ask you, right? And uh, it's interesting. There's a, there's a lot to this. I'm just going to say this really quickly. Um, Hone and I recently went through a training course um, to become foster parents. And part of that course you learn about how to heal a traumatized child. You learn about um, kids who have just some attachment disorders or who have, um, they've been through some hard things. And you learn how to grow that attachment. You learn how to heal any place in them that's been dealing with rejection or pain or trauma or attachment. And one of the things you do is actually this. You have them ask you, hey, can I have a Band-Aid? Yes, you can. Even though you see, you know, they need a Band-Aid. Can I have a cookie? Yes, you can. There's an asking. You actually have to make them ask. In fact, they, one of the things they do is like, you know, one of the activities they say is make a yes jar where anything they, every time they ask for anything in the jar, you always will say yes. Like there's something that happens in the human brain. When you ask and you receive, it brings healing and life to you. Isn't that interesting? It actually creates a bond and helps you go, oh, this is my source, and my source is safe and good. And it brings peace to you. And so, yes, God knows what we need, but God also wants us to ask, to remember who our source is. I don't think the asking is for God. I think the asking is for us. 
It's for us to remember who our source is, right? And so um, Jesus instructs his disciples how to pray. We're going to read this together. We're going to go old school. King James right here. I love it. Let's read. Why don't you just read this out loud in your house, in your apartment. Let your neighbors hear it. Who cares, right? We're going to read this loud. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I love this. Now, we're going to look at this uh, verse for a moment. Really, there, or this, this prayer. There's two sections, kind of this first half and the second half. And the first half is all the God-focused, God, you're sovereign, you're powerful, you're in heaven, you're so good, you know everything. You're a father. It's your kingdom, it's your way, it's your glory. God, 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 right? It's God-focused. And the second, the second half is very much my everyday. It feels lowly. It feels, you know, my, my daily needs, Deliver me, right? Help me, feed me, protect me. It's this kind of daily, it's both kind of the divine and the everyday. And I love that God wants to be involved in, in all of that. God is not just one and not the other. He is both infinitely huge and powerful and yet so personal and so present in our everyday. Something else I really love about this prayer is it's in the plural. Interesting. Jesus didn't teach us to pray, my father, who is in heaven. He taught us to pray our Father, right? Our Father, give us our daily bread. Forgive us. I think that's really powerful. There's something to me. I mean, of course, you can pray my Father, and, and there are absolute space for that, but there's something powerful about us remembering that we're a part of a body. Jesus was always pointing us back to, you're not an island. You're my kids. You're my family. You're in this together. We're all in this together. So when you pray, not only you're praying for yourself, but you're praying for your brother, your sister, right? You're praying for the body of Christ around the world. I love this. I often wonder if maybe we were just really meant to pray this together a lot. I love that. So we're going to just go through this really quickly, kind of piece by piece, just and ask God for some perspective this morning. It starts with our Father who is in heaven. God is a Father. He wants to be known as a Father, God's desire is that you would see him as a father, a good father, a faithful father, father who provides and protects and is nurturing and, and, you know, loves you and gives you direction. Some of us, maybe you never had a, a father or you didn't have a good father and God wants to heal and restore that, but, but God wants to be known as a father first and foremost. When we approach God, it should always not just be this like, oh God, way out there, he wants us to approach him like kids who just skip up to their daddy. He wants that kind of connection with you, that kind of closeness with you, our Father. Um, in fact, there are 63 scriptures in the Bible that make reference to the fatherhood of God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, yet for, yet for us there is only one God, the Father. He is the source of all things, and our lives are lived for him. God is the source of all things. Everything you need is wrapped up in him. You see, when we get our source right, things begin to flow in our life. So often we think our source is, I need a different job. I, my source is my paycheck. My source is this. My source is that. And we, we begin to get our, our, go to the wrong source, and the reality is God is a father who is the source of all things for you. You don't need a better job. Maybe you do. But first and foremost, you need God. And when you're connected to God, he will bring everything in your life that you need. Right? And so it's, it's getting the right alignment. God as our source. God as our father. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet still, Yahweh, you are our father. We're like clay, and you're the potter. Each one of us is the creative, artistic work of your hands. This, when we're praying, our Father who art in heaven, you're reminding yourself, I, I'm not God, you are. 
I'm just the clay in your hands, right? God, you are a good father. You are good and you are sovereign. He loves you. He wants to be approached as a father. And I love when it says, who art in heaven. It reminds us of his greatness, that he sees all, that he's sovereign. He's all powerful. He's bigger than whatever you're facing. You see that the Lord's prayer was not meant to just be something we recite. It's meant to be a model for how we pray, how we approach God. And once again, this is coming from Jesus. Jesus instructing us, hey, you want the secret? You want to know how to pray and things happen? You want to know how to have what I have? First approach him like a father. Understand how sovereign he is. Start there, right? And then it goes into hallowed is your name or holy is your name. You know, this is really taking a moment and contemplating the greatness of God, getting lost in his glory and his goodness. It's worshiping. It's, it's hallowing his name. The word hallowed means set apart, honored. Um, the Greek word in the New Testament, um, it's used about 30 times, but 26 of those times, it's translated as sanctified or set apart from evil. In fact, everywhere that word sanctified use, it's like the opposite of, the prof- of profane. It's the opposite of evil. God is saying, I, have, I am not the source of evil on the planet. I am not the source of pain. I am the actual opposite. Hallowed is my name. It's who I am. I am holy. I am good. I am righteous. I am sovereign right? I I am set apart from all that is evil. I am pure love. And I think sometimes in in our culture, it's so easy to hear about the love of God and the grace of God, and absolutely. But sometimes we forget that God is holy. God is holy. God hates evil and sin because it destroys us. He's a holy God. Um, Joyce Myers I love that she says, she has this saying, she says, um, grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy life. I love that. The reality is, is because God is holy, he invites us into his holiness. We're transformed by his holiness. When we understand that he's holy and we begin to commune with God, we, become to, we begin to be transformed. And the reality is the Holy Spirit isn't at work in our life just to give us goosebumps and woo, that felt great. The Holy Spirit is is working in our life to help us overcome sin, wrong patterns, dysfunctional, you know, relationships, dysfunctional way of thinking. The Holy Spirit is actively working to bring us into the holiness of Christ, to transform us. And the more we become like him, the more we get over our weird ideas and our pride and our selfishness and And, you know, or whatever, like just refusing to control our impulses, all these things, the more we we allow God to transform us and become like his holiness, the more we do that, the more free we are, the more happy we are, the more joyful we are, the more we're able to impact the world around us, the more attractive we are to the world around us. Jesus thought it was necessary for us to focus on the holiness of God before we begin to even ask for anything, right? And it goes on, your kingdom come. This is probably my favorite line in all of scripture, but your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love this. Jesus in his infinite wisdom knew that you and I needed to focus on God's kingdom, on his will. If we're ever gonna see things change on this earth, it is so easy, listen church, it is so easy to get so pulled in and sucked in to our kingdom, our everyday, our circumstances, what's happening in your house right now, the kid that's screaming that you've already threatened three times, I know, it's so easy to get sucked in just to our own agenda, our own feelings, our own comfort, our own thoughts, our our own perspective, we just get so sucked in, and Jesus was like, church, if you're going to be effective, you have to be focused on my kingdom, on the eternal right? I mean, I, I, how often you go somewhere, I don't even know that I'm thinking about somebody's eternity. I go to the grocery store, I'm like, are we social distancing? You know, is there any toilet paper? Like, I'm thinking about myself, right? How often am I even looking around and thinking about, where are these people going to spend eternity? I'm, I'm so easy to just not think about God's kingdom, his will, right? His agenda, what he's doing, And uh, I love that Jesus is like, constantly remind yourself to look up to his kingdom. 
right? Look to his will. And um, I mean, I, th- I love this. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What if we actually meant that? God, let your will be done, not my will. I mean, Jesus actually prayed that. Father, your will, not mine. It sounds nice, but so many of us, even in our prayers, our prayers are completely coded in my will. God, please do this because I, this is God, trust me, I know best for myself. I need you to do this for my life, right? And our prayers are even coded in our will. And if you've lived for a few minutes, you realize your will actually isn't even going to satisfy you because sometimes you get what you want and you're like, yeah, I'm still unsatisfied, right? True satisfaction only happens when we're walking in God's will, when we're walking in what he desires and his way. And, and so getting our way isn't even going to make us happy. It's not even going to fulfill us. And so um, Jesus reminds us to focus on God's kingdom and his will being done on earth. Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else, all all things will be added to you, right? Instead of seeking out what we want, truly asking God today, right now, today, God, help me to focus on your kingdom. Help me to focus on eternity. What are, what are eternal things? How do I put my, you know, how do I invest in your kingdom today? Not just my own comfort, right? And then you watch God add everything you need. Um, I think this is, so powerful when we do that. And then, of course, um, Jesus constantly reminding us in this prayer that God wants his kingdom on the earth. God wants his kingdom on the earth. And he wants to bring his kingdom through you and I. And I think about this all the time. Jesus isn't into busy work, right? He wasn't just like, oh, okay, these disciples are so annoying. Give them a prayer so they just stay busy. I'm going to go just do my stuff. No. Jesus told them to pray this because the reality is he obviously believed that if they prayed this, that the kingdom would come through them. Jesus understood that you and I have the ability to pull the kingdom of God to the earth. You and I have the ability to release the kingdom around us, to to usher in the kingdom. And our prayers are powerful enough to help bring that into, become a reality. It goes on, give us this day our daily bread. You know, for the first century Jew, bread was just a staple in their diet. It was essential. It's, you know, this, obviously it's not just talking about bread. This is talking about all the things we need, the daily, the essentials, the daily things we need. And so after this big kingdom focus, after understanding that he's a father and that he's sovereign, he's in heaven, and understanding that he is holy, and understanding that, that it's his kingdom and his way and his agenda, then... From that place, that perspective, we come and we lay before him. God, would you give us today our daily bread? Right? Um, when you think about this, you know, it's our, our needs, our daily, a daily bread is your needs, which is different than praying for kind of your greeds, if you will, right? Like the things you want. And you see Jesus in inviting um, his disciples into this, hey, don't worry about tomorrow. That's the example we just gave, right? Putting those heavy things into your soul. Like, don't stress about tomorrow. Trust me for today. Lean in for today. And I don't know about you, but my personality is not good, not good with that, right? I want a 10-year plan. I'm, I'm absolutely thinking about tomorrow. And God's like, I said there would be grace sufficient for you today. My mercies are new every day. Why are you trying to do something that I've not yet given you grace for? If you cross that bridge, there will be grace for it. Right now, today is where I am. Today, there's grace. And see, what I love about this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, it covers past, present, and future, right? Forgive us our sins. That's past. It covers present, our daily needs, our bread, right? And future, thy kingdom come, right? And, and let your will be done on earth. So it's covering your past, your present, and your future. But daily bread is, is Jesus saying, hey, don't get caught up in the what ifs. Don't get caught up in the how am I going to do it tomorrow. If you lean in today, there's provision for you today, right? Ask God to meet you today. And so nothing is too big or small to bring to him, right? He has the hairs on your head counted. He knows everything about us. He wants to provide for your needs. Listen, your father is good. He's not like, I hope you figure it out and leave you to yourself. That's not what a good father does. 
He is with you. He is present. He has got solutions for you you're not even thinking about. I have seen this in my own life. You know, I've, I've told you guys, you know, many times here stories about my childhood where growing up, my father wasn't present, and my, my mom just taught us every day, like, what do we need? We need food. Okay, God's your father, so ask him for food. We'd pray for food. Go to school. We'd come home, and there'd be bags of groceries left on our doorstep. We never knew who they were from. Okay, you need shoes? Pray and ask your father for shoes. We would ask God for shoes. I remember this one lady walking up to my mom at church. My brother needed a pair of tennis shoes, and we'd gone to the Don shoe store, and it was like going to be $38.09 for a pair of shoes, or I'm not making the number up, but something like that. And we left the store without the shoes because we didn't have the money. We went home and prayed. My mom was like, God's your father. Ask him for what you need. And we prayed, and we asked God. The next day, we go to church, and this woman walks up to my mom and is like, I hope this doesn't offend you. This is really weird. I woke up with this number going through my mind over and over. I feel like I'm supposed to give you this check for $38.09. The exact amount of the shoes my brother had picked out the day before at Don's shoe store that we had prayed and asked our daddy father to provide. Listen, God is a God who does the miraculous. How are we even going to believe for the crazy things we're believing for if we can't believe him for our daily bread, right? So Jesus is inviting us into, you have a good father, who will look after you. You are not alone. He will take care of you. He is a real father. Ask him daily for your bread. Remember that everything comes from him. And then it goes on, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. I'm not going to go into this too much because we talked about this recently. I would encourage you, encourage you if you're watching online, you can go back and listen uh, to a, a recent sermon we did where we talked about offense and unforgiveness. Um, but forgiveness isn't about absolving the perpetrator. It's about healing the victim. And actually what this, this verse is saying, and it's, it's kind of scary, it's God forgive me in the same way I'm forgiving people around me. It's a serious business, right? Most of us are like, eh, could you for, like, upgrade how, you know, how I forgive people? Could you forgive me that way? Like We want God's forgiveness, and the reality is God's forgiveness comes as we're forgiving others right? And so those are linked together. And daily, daily Jesus wanted us to remember this. Daily, as a follower of Christ, you're going to have to become a professional forgiver. That doesn't mean people are off the hook. It doesn't mean that it doesn't, you know, what they did wasn't wrong. It means that you let God deal with it. You let go. You can't carry the weight of it. You let God deal with it because offense is a trap from the enemy to destroy your soul. And so we have to let go. We have to forgive, right? And so Jesus includes this in this prayer. He said, hey, by the way, you're going to need this, so do it all the time. Pray all the time. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Now, you remember at the end of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, it says, at the very end of the prayer, it says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So the reality is this prayer isn't powerful if we're holding unforgiveness in our heart. And so for your prayers to be heard, for your prayers to be powerful, we have to choose to forgive. I know it's hard. It's very hard. But forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. And it's something that's so necessary for us to walk in freedom and power in our lives. And the prayer goes on. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And it's this place to remind ourselves, of course, God's not going to lead you ever into sin, but it's really a, God, help me to continue following you so I don't, I don't, you know, stray off and get myself into trouble. It's this daily reminder, you guys, daily we need to be asking God for discernment. God, help me to not fall into just becoming jaded, complacent, proud, right? Unforgiving, whatever it is. And so it's constantly in this prayer, we're reminded um, to ask God to lead us away from sin and to deliver us from evil. The reality is there's a real enemy who would love to take us out. And he takes people out in different ways. You know, maybe he can't get you with something that feels really crazy, but it's, he'll get you with just complacency or jealousy or, right, just the little, the little foxes that spoil the vine. Like, the enemy is prowling around, and so God is saying, hey, be on your guard. Be on your guard. 
Daily check in on your heart. Daily. Don't wait till there's a meltdown. Don't wait till you hate everybody. You're like, I think something's wrong. Like, daily check your heart, right? This is included in this prayer. And so, um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The only temptations that you have are the temptations that all people have. But you can trust God. He will not let you be tempted more than you can stand. But when you are tempted, God will also give you a way to escape that temptation. Hallelujah. Then you will be able to stand it. Listen, there is always an escape route. Just because you started down this track, just because you decided to quarantine with somebody you should not be quarantining quarantining with, doesn't mean that there is not an escape route and you need to get out of that hot mess right now, right? There's always an escape route. God will always provide a way out. Just because you started down the wrong road doesn't mean you need to continue down it, okay? God will help you. He will help you in all temptations. And let's not, let's be very careful not to judge people who sin differently than us, right? It's easy to judge how somebody sins over here, and yet we totally allow different behavior in our own life. And so this prayer is constantly reminding us daily, God, check my heart. Help me. Help me to make good choices today. Help me to stay on the path. Help me to to recognize where the enemy is trying to take me out. Help me to be alert. And then it ends with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's this beautiful, powerful declaration of allegiance to the kingdom of God. You know, I, I look at this, and this is the model Jesus taught us to pray. And we're told, once again in Scripture, pray all the time. Pray all the time. Be committed to praying. Do it. Pray like this, right? There's something to this, you guys. This isn't just, oh, I'm going to, you know, I don't know, get in touch with my Catholic roots and just really start just reciting things, like, if that's all that ever meant to you. Like, understand that there is power in this. There's power in the invitation to pray. Prayer connects you to your life source. Prayer changes you. And and Jesus gave us a model of how to do it. I love this. It gives us eternal perspective. You know, I I really believe it's time to awaken or maybe reawaken um, our prayer life, church. It's time to wake up to our prayer life. It's time to, to become spiritually sensitive again. I think we've gotten a little complacent with just the comfort of the world around us. And we need to to plug in to the power source. And it happens in prayer. It happens in prayer. It's time to open up that dialogue with God. You have a good and loving father who, who is so present to you right now. Somebody watching, you're alone in your house, you feel so alone, you feel so disconnected to God. Listen to me, you have a good father who is right now willing and available and ready to you. He is available to you. He wants to move powerfully in your life. He's waiting for the invitation, he's waiting for the connection to flow through you. We're not victims right now. We're not victims to this circumstance. We are not victims to this virus. Let me tell you, we are sons and daughters of the living God, and we have access to everything in the kingdom. And it's time to connect. It is time to press in. It is time to stop looking for other people, or or, I just hope these circumstances change so I'm okay. No, peace is found in a person, not circumstances. Peace is found in the Prince of Peace. It's it's who God is. It's, It's connecting to him. And it's time to awaken our prayer life, church. Not just because we need things, but because it's time that we move past ourselves and get connected for real to the living God. That we plug into our life source. I I just keep seeing this picture of prayer. It's like when you're so thirsty, you come to a deep well. That's what prayer is. When you're hungry, you come to a, a feast that's set before you in a table. That's what prayer is. Prayer is connecting to your source. It it will transform you and and change you and give you better perspective, and you will be empowered to actually bring change to your everyday world. I want to just say this. We're going to close. You're like, I mean, we're not even there, and she's still going long. Yes, I am, all right? Um, (laughs) I want to say this. I know there might be people that are watching 
Maybe like church is not your thing. Maybe you don't even know if God's your thing. And I want to say this. You have, what do you have to lose to give God a try? You have a loving father who wants to be near, who wants to intervene, who's good. You know, maybe you heard the verse we read that says the prayer, you know, that God hears the prayers of a righteous person or that a righteous person, you know, that their prayers get a lot done, they're effective. And you might be saying, well, I'm not righteous. I'm not, I'm, my, my life is messy. Listen, none of us are righteous outside of Jesus. None of us deserve the, the title righteous. We are only made righteous because of what Jesus has done for us. We're all a mess outside of him. No matter what anybody tries to tell you, right? We are made righteous through what Jesus did. Jesus went to the cross for you. Jesus gave his life so that he could take your mess and your brokenness and in exchange give you his righteousness, his right standing with God, right? His His cleanness, his purity, his holiness. He gives us that and he takes on himself our brokenness and our sin and our mess, And I want to just say, if if there's anybody watching today, and you don't have this relationship with God, but you're feeling desperate, and you're like, "I, I feel like I need to pray, and I don't even know how to do it. My prayer is that you would be connected to your source, your creator, the one who loves you, your good father. And so I want to pray with you. And then I'm going to pray for all of us. I'm going to pray that there is an awakening to our prayer life. And I want to encourage you, church, begin to pray this daily. Memorize this. Learn this. Pray this with your kids every day. Just Let's begin to declare this all week long, every day. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And let this get deep in our soul as we reawaken prayer in our lives. All right? Would you just pray with me? Father, I pray for every person that's watching right now. Anybody who feels disconnected from you, God, or anybody who feels lost in this season or doesn't feels like they're all alone, I pray, God, that you would begin to just be so near them right now in this moment they would feel your presence and your nearness. And Father, for anybody who says or who feels like they're not connected to you or they're not righteous, Lord, I pray right now that they would understand and receive the gift that you've given them. And I want to just encourage you, if you're watching, just would you just repeat after me? Jesus, I give you my life. God, you are my source. You're my creator, and you're my father. I give you all my mess. I give you all my fear. I give you all my anxiety. I give you my sin. I give it all to you. I give you my life. And God, I thank you that in exchange, you give me your peace. You give me forgiveness. You give me love and acceptance. God, I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love today. Break into my life and break into my home. God, I invite you to take over in my life. I want to walk in the peace and the power that Jesus walked in. God, I have strayed, I am off course, and I am coming back to you today. God, be the center of my life. I give you everything, and I receive all of your love. I thank you that I have access to you, and I ask that you would lead my life, be the Lord of my life. I follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. And God, we pray for our family, our community, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would awaken a hunger for prayer in us. Anywhere, God, where we have just, um, I don't know, kind of gotten sleepy in this area, Lord, I pray that you would awaken us to the power of prayer in our life. Help us all day long to cast our anxiety on you because you care for us. Help us to give it to you, to constantly give it to you in prayer. And I pray, Lord, that you would teach us the power of this model of prayer. That our lives would be focused on you first and foremost, and your greatness, and your fatherhood, and your your kingdom, and your glory. And that we would be faithful to bring you our needs. 
for the daily and that we would watch you move in our midst. God, I pray that all over this city, that prayer would just begin to rise so powerfully that hell would be shattered, that this virus would be shattered, that darkness would be shattered, that loneliness would be shattered, and that life and hope and healing and truth would rise up in this city and in the cities where people are watching. We thank you, Father, and once again, we ask that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen.